Well, hello everyone. My name is Rose Sullivan and I am your professor this summer for human biology for social workers. Um, this video lecture is part introduction and part content and you should see this also as you uh, look into the folder for this week's work in module one. So just as a means of introducing us and kind of orienting us to the class this summer, Human Biology for Social Work will have six modules, all organized into folders, uh, that open Monday to Monday. So, uh, so on the first day of class, Monday, obviously, you should be able to access everything in the first module, and the second module will open then the following Monday. Uh, the class is pass-fail, and um, I know that a number of you are taking uh, this class because you're enrolled in an MSW program or some other kind of graduate program um, coming up in the fall. One of the great things about this class, being that it's a fully online class, is that you can be mobile during this class. Um, personally, I will be um, conducting the class online from at least two different campgrounds in northern New England on uh, some weekend trips that I promised my family. So I'm not exactly sure why I promised them that I would do that, but I did. And as long as you have Wi-Fi, you are free to move around anywhere. And I've just been kind of scanning our roster and I see that there are people from all over New England and, and also the west coast of the U.S. So we are from everywhere and uh, you can obviously do this work at your pace at whatever time you'd like to do it from wherever you are as long as you can kind of loosely follow that Monday to Monday schedule. Um, I gave you my cell phone number here in, in this slide. Um, Play-Doh email is the best way to email me and you can see that when you are on the, uh, the class page. You can click on communications and that takes you to the email. Uh, you can also call me or text me at this number here, 413-387-9747. I'm happy to hear from you if there's something that you need to ask or something that you need to clarify. Uh, text or calling is fine. Um, just a little bit of a word quickly about some of the technological stuff. You really don't need really super high level technological equipment to do just fine in this course. If you are having technical problems, the folks at CIT, which is the Center for Institutional Technology, they're really, really great. And so if you have trouble with accessing something or trying to get to something that you think you should see, you can, if it's during business hours, you can call the Center for Institutional Technology at Westfield. They're in the Wilson uh, building, and there's always somebody there to help you by phone. If you're, if you're after hours, if you're after 5 o'clock, you can click on Help which is on that Plato kind of main page and it will send kind of, it will send an alert to someone at CIT and even after hours they try to get back to people pretty quickly so there is a lot of support there um, I am not always the greatest person to help people with technological problems if there's something about the course content like if we're covering some topic that that you feel like you don't understand or that you're not sure what I'm trying to say I'm really happy to call you or have email or talk about trying to make the, the concepts clearer, but sometimes people will email me or call me and say, I can't get this video to come up, or uh, when I click on that page, it just goes blank. And I, I am not necessarily the best person to help with that kind of thing, um, because so much depends on the settings of your computer and, st and stuff like that. So my two kind of blanket suggestions for... Um, helping with technological stuff is the first one is uh, it's it's really important for the online classes that you not have a pop-up blocker on sometimes these videos or other online assignments kind of they're technically pop-ups so if you have blocked all of that those things won't come up so that's kind of a common uh, trouble that sometimes people have they have to disable their pop-up blocker uh, the other piece of just basic advice that I feel like I can give folks is that if you're having trouble with one browser, say like Firefox, um, sometimes sometimes just quitting Firefox and then going back into the Westfield site onto Play-Doh from another browser like Chrome or Safari, sometimes that 
solves problems. And I don't know why that solves problems, but apparently it does. So those, besides those two pieces of basic technological advice, I would direct you over to the folks at the Center for uh, Institutional Technology at CIT. And my last point there is something that's just a given. I have run online classes for Westfield quite a bit, um, lots of different kinds of classes. Inevitably, I screw up somehow or the system screws up somehow. Um, so there are going to be glitches and we will not freak out, basically, is the big message there. Uh, I certainly have made mistakes on my end where it, it makes difficult, you know, makes it difficult for students to see things or... Gosh, one time we had like a massive power outage and nobody could get online for two days. You know, like all of these crazy things happen. We are just not going to worry about it because there really isn't anything that could go on that, that we can't fix. It's one way or another. So one of the things that's really weird about an online class is that we all don't ever really get to see each other. And so this is a picture of me, actually. Um... This is a picture of me that was taken in Ireland. Um, half of my family is from Ireland and the other half of my family is from Canada. And so I took this picture at a, on a trip that um, I took to see the town where my father and his family uh, were born and, and kind of originated from. But it sounds strange, but I'm just putting that picture on there so you know who's talking and it, you know, since we're probably not going to see each other in person ever, you have some idea of who I am um, as we go through this class. One of the things that you all are going to do in the first class is just a series of introductions. And if you feel like um, attaching a picture, you can. You don't have to do that, but it would certainly be kind of interesting to see who's in the class. So that's me. That's my, that's my introduction to you all. Um, as we start this class, so you have a sense of who's rambling on and on at you as we go. So starting from the beginning, why would we ask social workers to study biology? Um, why are we making you do this? If you're, if you're taking this course as a requirement for future graduate studies, it might not have been your uh, preferred thing to do to get ready for graduate school, but you were required to. So why, why are you required to? basically because it all comes down to biology somewhere, somehow, that the psychological and social dimensions are heavily, heavily influenced by biology. And you all are going to watch a short video uh, during this week that I think is going to bring that point home. Many, many human problems begin as biologically based issues. So even, for example, if you take something like uh, poverty, um, one of the uh, demographics of people who are living in poverty is that they often have chronic health conditions that make full-time work difficult or impossible. If you look at people living in poverty, sometimes it's health care costs that have bankrupted them. And so conditions related to health and, and physical ability and just, just general biological well-being are actually often at the root of larger social problems that we might not even recognize as related. One of the things that we're going to talk a lot about in the course is brain science. Uh, we're going to talk about the power of genetics and, and conditions that are uh, inherited. We're going to talk a lot about epigenetics, which is literally where the social and emotional factors influence what genetic material gets expressed. And again, we're going to be talking much more about that in, in future modules. One of the things that has a huge effect, uh, biologically speaking, on people that sometimes we don't recognize is uh, exposure to environmental toxins, say for example, and drug and alcohol use and its effects on people's development and their physical development, their physical health. So we study all of these things because ultimately, kind of getting back to that first slide, so many of the psychological and social dimensions that we deal with with people are heavily, heavily influenced by biology. So what exactly is biology? Simply speaking, it is the science of living things. And biology is what we would call a quote unquote hard science, which means that it uses the scientific method to ground any inquiry. So there is a hypothesis that gets made about someone's condition. There is data collection and data, data gathering, data analysis, and then conclusions that are drawn based on that. Um, 
and although those are the, the hallmarks of quote-unquote hard sciences, one of the things I think that social workers very quickly realize is that we do that in our own way in the social work profession as well. Biology is also the connectedness of psychological features, biochemistry, genetics, and molecular study, and we're going to go through all of those in this course. We're going to um, be identifying the significance of all of those factors. So looking at some major theories, biology, culture, and the ecological perspective. The, ecolog the ecological perspective, or the ecological theory rather, was developed by Yuri Bronfenbrenner, and it essentially describes a, person experience, a person's experience where the individual, as you can see, is in the center of these concentric circles. They are affected and in turn affect the microsystem, which is made up of those factors you see in the purple, followed by the mesosystem, the orange, the exosystem in the, in the blue, and the macrosystem as a whole. So the microsystem, sometimes social workers get very focused on the microsystem because we oftentimes are working with individuals and their families or we're working with them in a home-based setting or a school setting or maybe even at a, a neighborhood level, at a group level. But sometimes we forget of the uh, the larger systems that affect kids, kids, kids. I'm thinking about, but also adults, which is, for example, the larger the larger neighborhood factors. Say, for example, or uh, larger policies around work. Say, for example. So, if you're say, for example, you're a pregnant worker, and you uh, run into trouble with your pregnancy, and you need to take time off of work. It would be a mesosystem factor if your workplace gave you trouble about that, for example, or told you that they wouldn't hold your job, or told you that you would have to quit your job or they would fire you if you missed a lot of work, say, for example, because of your pregnancy. Massachusetts recently actually passed a law called the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which tried to make it illegal for people to be discriminated against, say, for example, a pregnancy. But that continues, and that's not exactly a microsystem issue that's more of a mesosystem kind of law issue. The exosystem are some of those larger forces that influence people. Um, mass media, obviously, social media, um, community services that are available to them. If you live in a well-resourced area, that's probably going to benefit you versus if you live in um, an area that has a lot of deprivation and you don't have access to things. Obviously, that's a exosystem issue as well. Um, and the macro system is the very, very large, uh, really cultural values that shape how we live and how, how, we, um, how we interpret the world. And so, for example, someone might have a very strong cultural value about uh, seeking help outside the family, for example. That would have pretty direct effect on whether or not somebody felt comfortable in dealing with the social worker. Um, all of those cultural beliefs that that come with one's upbringing goes in the macro system. And one of the things that any social work education usually asks people to do is to try to analyze themselves and analyze the cultural values and beliefs uh, and customs that shape you and then therefore would shape your work as a social worker. Uh, so that is a very famous um, theory that is is also biologically based, uh, and we'll go and I'll explain that in a moment. But you'll see this many many times in your social work education, and I'm sure go into it with much more depth. So the issue of determinism is a biological principle that really is defined as uh, the principle that life's events follow a set of natural laws that cause the outcome of human development. Sometimes in social work, we call this the trajectory of development. An example of that is, say, childhood depression. If you were working with a child that had uh, a number of risk factors for depression, including a family history, say, for example, of mental illness, uh, if they were dealing with very, very difficult external stressors, poverty, uh, parental addiction, um, family violence, any of those kinds of larger social problems, 
that would exacerbate perhaps a, a genetic predisposition to depression. And so if you had a child that had this, this combination of biological factors and social and emotional factors that would, that would lead you to think that they uh, were suffering from depression, one of the things that we would look at in terms of determinism is the idea that if nothing happens to help that child, that their depression is going to become worse and worse and worse and might even become so severe that at some point they're, they're looking at hospitalization or very, very severe symptoms of depression, including psychotic behaviors. So, for, so determinism would say that if nothing happens to help a child, say for example in this, in this example with depression, that, that their depression is going to get worse because that would be uh, the principle that depression as an illness without treatment gets more and more severe. And so that would be determinism. However, the issue with determinism in social work, of course, is that it cannot account for the changes that might happen in the social environment that might intervene and then influence the outcome. So if you had a child who was struggling with depression and they happened to get a really fantastic teacher in school that made a huge difference in their life, that is a social factor that might interrupt the trajectory or the determinism. If you had a, if you're working with a child with depression and um, the family that, that that child's family was willing to try a, a a trial of medication to see if that would help, that would obviously count as treatment. If if you were as a social worker successful in in persuading a family to try that, then that's a social factor that might influence the outcome. So. We can't, determinism, determinism is a biological uh, definition, and we see it in social work, but we also want to make sure that we put the asterisk there, that it doesn't have to be that way entirely. The bioecological model is also uh, the creation of Yuri Bronfenbrenner, and that talks about uh, the interaction between the biological composition of a person and the emotional and social factors. The most powerful interactions occur consistently between a person and their environment. Uh, one of the important propositions is that these interactions are reciprocal between the person and their environment, and that these interactions can shape the expressions of, of different genetic material. And so, once again, I'm not going to go into too much detail about that because you're going to see a short video here in a moment. I think that's going to capture that. but. The, the important sort of presumptions of this model is that the, the individual and their individual biological makeup is actually interacting and influencing the social environment as well as the other way around. So this last slide is giving you a, 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 a hint of what this video is about. It's about the development of the Adverse Childhood Experiences instrument and the research that went with that. There's a video about that, and there's also an article about the, uh, the ACE instrument or the, the ACE study. Uh, the article also contains the actual questionnaire itself, so if you're interested and you would like to see your own ACE score, you, could, you can do that. Um, certainly not a requirement for the class, but it is kind of interesting to see that. So I'm going to conclude this lecture so that people can go on with the rest of the online activities for the course and let you know that I'm really uh, excited to get to know you online and potentially see your pictures and uh, read your discussions and, and just kind of start to see where you all take the material that we present in the course. So thanks very much.